Can anyone hear me now? I can. Um, Webex cunningly put the stop sharing button over the unmute button. <laughs> Um, yeah, so apparently the lobby, so I guess the lobby works. Um, ah, I, uh, okay. I yeah, didn't so... remember enabling it, but basically um, uh, we, we basically have to let people in at some point, or we can also turn off the lobby at some point then. Yeah, okay. So I could see like Christian and Anna, but they're not in here. They're like WebEx is showing them, but now you're sharing your screen. It's not, it's such a bad interface. It's not great. Yeah, so there's there's a bunch of people. There's also Magnus. Do we want Magnus in here? <laughs> Who's that guy? Yeah. <laughs> we could. Well, I can, we can at least put the presenters in already. Yeah. Um, so let's see. I'm admitting Magnus. Good evening, Magnus. He's, I guess the audio isn't there yet. Yeah, I made some quick slides. But did you see the dude that just uh, opened that issue on uh, turning off TLS? <laughs> you seem yeah, pretty yeah. unhappy with me closing it. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. But, I saw the ticket and then... Uh... Good evening, my gentlemen. Good evening. We, uh, we still have people waiting in the lobby for a little while longer, but we put you in now uh, in case there's anything we wanted to chat about beforehand. Yeah. Okay, I don't know really. I mean, <sighs> I don't think there is, but um, no, I mean, I uh, catched up on the mail list, mail list discussion. I was behind some hundred messages, but now I'm catched up. Yeah. And, so, where's my fan going nuts? It's coding video, oh, okay. <laughs> <In> various qualities. <laughs> brave, brave is recording the meeting. That's probably what's going on. Oh, well. All right. Um, yeah. And I'm recording already, I guess. Am I? Yes, recording. Does that mean this chat is. <laughs> yeah, I'll cut it out. I'll cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> what um, should I say? Um, I. So I've Magnus, had... you're the best AD I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to be the start of the video. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I usually forget to do the recording or to start the recording, which is why I auto start it and then cut it later. A bit for yeah. cheap now. Yeah. Okay, but basically, sort of the the um, stuff is on the data track. I uploaded the materials uh, earlier on the agenda, and um, I'm gonna try and keep people to Q and A uh, on clarifications during the presentations, and then we have a hopefully long enough slot in the end. Yeah. Uh, to talk. Hopefully that's, yeah, I think it's, uh, you think you have to keep the presenter short also. Uh, we have to time them a little bit, yes. So yeah. um... <laughs> Because otherwise it's going to be more than the five minutes plus five minutes for clarifications. Yeah. Um, do you, so, so I think we're going to, should we try and do the use the the, the Webex chat, uh, Lucas, or do you want to do Jabber, which not everybody has? I mean, I'd encourage people to to speak verbally, but use the Webex chat just for key management. Um, okay. I, I don't know. Do people want to really make written comments? That well, people typically chat um, on the site somewhere, and so um... let, let them do what they want. Hmm. I'd like to keep the WebEx chat clean um, so okay. we can manage the view effectively. Well, so then I should maybe open the, the, the thing just in case, the quick working group. Yeah. It's Lucas, Spencer, Xi Junzun, you and yeah. Undefined. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's see if our Java channel are, now works in the Slack. Um, oh, the, the bridge. I'm not that he fixed it. Hmm. A quitter. Well, no, it didn't, or at least not quickly. <laughs> but I guess you should start letting people in if you. I mean, it's free yeah. to um, So 
there. Okay, yeah, the bridge works. Yeah. Does it? Yeah, he just came through. That was, me type, that was me typing there. <laughs> um, okay. So nothing comes through. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, admitting. Yeah. Let's see if I can turn off this waiting room somehow. So well, if there's anybody here that knows how to turn off the lobby now <laughs> in Webex, please let me know, because I don't. So if we actually have a lobby, which I didn't have when I joined, this is because you selected the wrong um, WebEx meeting type when you scheduled the meeting. No, I actually okay. enables a lobby, um, but I thought I could turn it off in the meeting, which I can't figure out how to do. I can't help you with that. And you're the Map RG research group, by the way, Mirja. I know, I don't know how to change that. <laughs> It's it's good to see that it's not me getting too old that uh, created this lobby. I can expel you, but I can't rename you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got I got the hint that I have to reinstall WebEx to make it go away, but didn't do it yet. <laughs> Try what happens if you right click on your name. I can only mute me. That's all I can do. Okay. Same. And apologies, EDM program is Tommy over here. Hi, <laughs> Tommy. And this is why we still say our names to the mic, right? And I will never use this lobby thing again. I'm clicking so much. I, I can take over for that if you want, Lars. Well, we can we can both click, I guess. Um, yeah, if you let people in, I'll, I'll start talking. So, so uh, welcome, folks, to the um, quick working group interim meeting. The first one after our uh, main draft space drafts are in ITF last call. So that's a, a round of applause. And normally we probably have some drinks now or, or yesterday, but um, it is what it is. Um, glad you could all make it. There's still people coming in, um, but you're not missing much. The first thing I'm going to show you, you should already know, which is the ITF node well. There's a lot of text here. I've sort of highlighted the stuff that I think is most important, which is you should really read BCP 79 if you're participating here um, and if you're making contributions. And if you don't know what the terms contribution and participation are defined to be, you should definitely read BCP 79. Um, there are some reminders here that are a subset of what you will find in that document, which is if you're participating here, you agree to following our processes and policies. We have a whole bunch of these. 
Um, the IPR policy is, is arguably the most important one, which is that if you uh, make a contribution that's covered by patents or patent applications that are controlled by you or your by sponsor, you must disclose that or you must not participate in the discussion. Again, for what participate means, means you need to read BCP 79 and you agree um, to um, be civil in your um, participation and work respectfully with others. That should not come as a surprise, as I said. Um, we have very little uh, administrivia. Um, we need a scribe. I think I saw uh, something fly by from Robin that he's volunteering, um, but would like a second. Do we have a second for him? And if you are willing to be a second, if you type that in the chat, so we know. Also, everybody's obviously welcome to uh, go to this uh, Cody MD uh, link that has also just been pasted into the Slack. It's also linked from the agenda, and you can help um, um, Robin out there. Um, there's a question about blue sheets. Um, I uh, was brave enough to rely on the WebEx registration uh, feature for this, which I have never used before. Um, I will. Uh, when the first presentation starts, go and look and see um, what what data that gives me. I, I asked it to collect names and affiliations. Uh, we'll see if it actually did that. Um, if uh, there's a problem, I'll do an interrupt at some point and we do the blue sheet inside the Cody MD or something. Uh, but for now, I'm, I'm trusting in WebEx. Um, for the chat, um, Lucas is going to monitor the queue and, and manage the queue. So we would like to use the WebEx chat for queue management uh, exclusively um, so that things don't get lost there. And if you feel like you want to chat, um, we have an IETF uh, um, Jabber room um, that some people are in, but, but not very many, actually. And unfortunately, the um, bridge we had between the Slack Jabber uh, channel and the XMPP uh, group on the ITF uh, Jabber server seems to be broken. I don't know if Mnode is here or not, but if you are here, Mark, uh, can you kick that uh, proxy uh, into submission so that hopefully stuff gets um, relayed? Okay. Robin, do you have a second or um, are we still waiting for one? I think we're still waiting. Okay. But I can start and see if anyone joins. Yeah, I'm, I'm also recording this meeting, um, which um, this slide should have told you already. You, you are uh, <laughs> acknowledged that we're making video recordings of you. Um, and so there's something else to go back to uh, other than the minutes, but the, the minutes are usually much more convenient than um, the recording. Anybody else willing to help uh, Robin out? I guess it's just you, Robin. Uh, feel free to interrupt people if you uh, need them to slow down or repeat something since you are on your own, unfortunately. So the, I just got joined by an anonymous pink person, so I think we're fine. Me, I can, I can help out. Thank you, anonymous pink person. Put your name in the in the minutes so that we can credit you and Robin both. I didn't catch who that was. Right. Um, the agenda is, is relatively uh, uh, simple. Um, we are um, at bullet one. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about scoping uh, right after this. Um, we asked the uh, mask working group chairs um, in, in the last day or two if if or somebody from mask if they would be available to give an overview the reason was that that lucas and i looked at the presentations uh, that we're going to see in terms of use cases and requirements and roughly sort of half of those use quick as some sort of tunnel rather than as an end-to-end -end protocol and so since since we have a working group chartered on that which isn't us uh, we thought it might be helpful to give a quick overview of what mask offers in addition to uh, what what i'll briefly be talking about just with quick offers. Um, and with those two sort of overview uh, overviews in our heads, we can then go and look at the use cases and requirements. Uh, we have six of those. Um, we uh, ask people to be very brief. We're going to try and do the presentation in, in five minutes and leave five minutes for Q&A. 
We're going to try and keep the Q&A during that part of the agenda on clarification only. Uh, and we have 40 minutes uh, on open discussions at the end where we can have like a broader and, and deeper discussion on um, things. Any um, questions on the agenda? Any bashing that people want to do? I guess not. Right. So, so the the point of the meeting is to talk uh, about multipath in quick, and and this sort of uh, Ian sort of suggested that we have this meeting uh, after we had some exchanges on the mailing list, uh, where you know uh, a few people who uh, maybe don't hang out on the implementer Slack uh, all day long uh, were surprised that at least some part of the implementers community had sort of maybe moved away from our initial belief that multipath was something that we definitely wanted to do for quick. Um, that was the state uh, three years ago when we wrote the charter. Um, Google at the time had been experimenting with multipath and were still pretty positive about it. And so it seemed like the right thing to do to just you know put that into the initial charter of quick. Three years later, um, at least for some people, the uh, support that ITF quick has for connection migration and for more migration to preferred server address uh, hits most of their use cases. And so, so some people have sort of questioned whether um, multipath is something that Quick should do. Um, others remain very much interested in doing it. And so we wanted to uh, give people time to talk about multipath specifically for a little, little bit uh, longer and in a bit more detail. Um, and then we see what that means for us going forward specifically for our meeting at ITF 109. Um, at, at the moment, um, I think we're going to plan on having a significant chunk of that session set aside to talk about any ITF last call issues that might have been raised in the meantime, and, and we can't really predict um, how much time those will need. I, I guess um, in the absence of anything else important happening, we would use the remainder of any time for multipath because I think that's at the moment the other big topic. But there's also the ops drafts and various extension drafts that probably might have seen updates by then. So we'll, we'll see what we do. But we, we wanted to talk about multipath now, and so that's why we're here. Um, right. So, so quick, um, as you all know, I would assume is an end-to-end -end protocol. It's encrypted. Um, there's a client and a server, um, and quick has some support for using um, multiple network paths, uh, but, but they're not very um, powerful. Specifically, um, a server uh, can tell the client during the uh, TLS handshake with the transfer parameter what its preferred addresses are there for v4 and v6 that the client should be migrating to. Uh, so that's a way for the server side to make the client migrate, well, to, to suggest to the client that they really should migrate um, to another address. Um, the, the other option uh, on the client side is um, a migration uh, that can either be passive, meaning a NAT rebinds or something that the client might not even know, or the client can actively use a different IP address and port and, and uh, connection ID to talk to the server. Um, from, an, from another endpoint. And there's this path validation that happens then. Uh, and the client can do this multiple times. So those are the sort of two mechanisms that Quick uh, has. And they allow you uh, not parallel use of multiple paths, but they allow you sort of, quote unquote, some sort of failover capabilities. Um, although you can make an argument that the server side is not very strong, right? So, so there's something in Quick um, on, on, on failing over, which is, is helpful. The multipath and multipath TCP uh, offer much more than that. Um, specifically, they offer uh, a TCP connection to use multiple network paths at the same time for a single connection. And that's sort of, um, it's not failover, but it's pooling the capacity and using the aggregate capacity of those paths at the same time. And that's something that quick version one, as we've specified it now, does not have. And I think, when the, the charter was written, uh, that was sort of the desired addition that we wanted to to uh, uh, talk about when on this on this multipath um, milestone. Um, but it was never really clearly defined, and therefore, going into the use cases, some of the use cases are much more focused on on the failover part, and others are maybe much more focused on the capacity pooling part. And it's useful to sort of understand that the mechanisms look similar, but they're actually different. And you know, failover might be enough for one use case, while another really requires this this pooling of capacity. 
Okay. Um, with that, I think we're going to try and then go to the to the mask overview that talks about using Quick as a tunneling protocol. And I would prefer if people could run from their own uh, machine. I forgot to say that earlier. On a pass through the presenter ball, um, if you can't, let me know and I can show the slides. Um, uh, Lars, David yes. can have you here presenting for mask. Uh, I can't. I'm presenting or I, I'm watching this in the web and I don't think you can do that from the web client. So if you don't mind, it's only six slides. It would be helpful if you didn't mind driving. I, I can drive. Uh, I'm doing it from the web client too. So it is possible. <laughs> oh, okay. well, all good to know for now. There's a share button. There's a share button, but it doesn't matter. I, I can find it and do it. Um, you were mask. Okay, um, I want to share something else. An application. While you're working on that, Lars, um, I'm going to have to. I have a hard stop an hour into the meeting, and uh, I would love to get a few words in, uh, a couple thoughts in before I have to go at some point. It's Roberto. Okay, uh, sounds good. Thank you. Um, is this visible, or should I go full screen? If I go full screen, I can't see stuff anymore in the browser. Oh, then it's, it, it, it's it. I think it's uh, legible. Yeah, I can make it bigger. That's not a problem, but can oh, yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, th that's very reasonable. Thank you. Um, okay, just to, just to remind people, we'll have five minutes per presentation, and then five minutes afterwards for some questions on that presentation before opening up for discussions after all the presentations are complete. All right. Okay. Five, five minutes. Here I come. All right. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David Skenazi. I work on Chrome, but most of you already know me as a quick enthusiast uh, and also as a mask enthusiast. So uh, I'm here today just, uh, as Lars was saying, to quickly explain what um, mask uh, is and how it might be relevant to multipath. Next slide, please. Uh, so. Um, HTTP3, uh, which is HTTP over quick, uh, is an ITF last call, and it's a truly great protocol. And it's a great protocol for the web, but not just for all the a lot of other use cases. And one of them is proxy. Um, HTTP has supported Connect for a long time, and that's great for proxying TCP. Um, but like the Internet is not just TCP, and especially when you had Quicken, that becomes quite limiting. So MASK is a newly formed um, ITF working group, which we formed this year, with the goal of adding new options for proxying over HTTP3. So how do we have things that are maybe a little bit like Connect, but, but different or more powerful or for more use cases? Um, and just to... Uh, I'm not going to go read the entire charter, but one of the things that were uh, that are explicit in the mask charter is that multipath itself and, and also the discovery of mask proxies are out of scope for for mask. Uh, I'll go into more detail a little bit about those later, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, there's absolutely no synergy. It means that mask could benefit from multipath if it were to happen in quick, for example. Next slide. All right, so what does MASK, what does the MASK working group do concretely today? Uh, because um, initially like there were uh, various different proposals for MASK and what we landed on as current work items are the first one is connect UDP. So take the connect you know and love and instead of TCP, you do it for UDP. Uh, that's kind of all there is to it. The slightly interesting bit is that um, when you're running over HTTP3, you can use datagram frames, which are an extension to Quick, not part of the Quick V1 core protocol, but they're an extension that allows you to send little bite-sized pieces of data that are not retransmitted. So that's exactly what you want for something like Connect UDP, because it means that if that packet is lost on the client to mask link, it doesn't get retransmitted by that. So if you were to run, let's say, quick over Connect UDP, you don't end up with nested uh, uh, loss recovery loops, which can often be inefficient. Uh, another topic is something that we don't have an exact name for. It might be Connect IP, but the idea would be to have a way to do VPN services and other things like that over HTTP 3. 
So what we have right now in the Mask Working Group is we've adopted a document to discuss requirements for VPN over HTTP3. Uh, the goal being that once we agree on the requirements, we're still building a solution which could end up looking like a method called Connect IP or something different. Um, and then something that uh, came up lately that is not adopted yet is, uh, so mainly written by Tommy Polly from Apple and uh, also myself, uh, is an extension to Connect UDP that would make it quick aware. And so, if you don't have that, you would still do Connect UDP. You can run Quick over Connect UDP, but with something that is aware of Quick, you can do optimizations. An example of one is disabling double encryption, which are, in some use cases can be useful. All right, next slide, please. So now, where does this fit in with multipath? Because that's mask, but today we're mainly here to talk about multipath. So apologies for the kind of ugly looking graphic. I did that kind of in a rush yesterday. Uh, so in the, here's one example where, so the connection between the client and the mask server, or you can call it the mask proxy. Uh, so that's an HTTP3 connection, which is you know underneath a quick connection. Uh, you could do multi-path on that connection. So that means that you know, your quick between the client and the mask proxy can multipath, and let's say if your client is a phone that has a Wi-Fi antenna and a cell antenna, it can potentially, so today already, it can transition between them using connection migration, but in a hypothetical world where multipath quick exists, you could send on both paths. Uh, but one thing that I want to point out is that this is very orthogonal to mask because, um, Let's say, for example, if your end-to-end -end traffic shown in red here on the diagram is, you know, over TCP. So let's say, you know, you're you you just told your client to the proxy, hey, I want to do connect, and then you did to the web server on port four four three, and then you did an end-to-end -end TLS, and then you have HTTP on top of that. Then, like, there's no mask involved whatsoever there. That's something that's a vanilla HTTP three, uh, and that could benefit potentially from multi uh, from multipath. Um, similarly, connect UDP could. But kind of the thinking there is you don't need to change mask to get multipath. You if if quick has it, then mask gets it for free. So they're kind of orthogonal efforts that can benefit from one another, but you don't really need to change mask for this or any of the like documents discussed in mask. Um, next slide, please. And another example of a way that multipath can interact with mask is let's is end-to-end multipath. So let's say you have an HTTP3 connection between your client and your target web server. You could have, for example, one leg going direct over Wi-Fi and one leg going over a mask connection to a proxy. So that could be used, for example, if you have one network that you trust, you can go end to end and another one that you really don't trust or you want an extra layer of obfuscation and you use mask for that or, or other reasons. Um, in this case, similarly, it's also pretty much orthogonal to mask because from the perspective of mask, of the connection between the client and the mask server, it's just shoveling encrypted packets back and forth. It doesn't really care that you have that other leg uh, on the side over Wi-Fi. It doesn't, it doesn't even know about it and it doesn't need to. So kind of similarly, this could benefit uh, for, uh, Multipath and mask can benefit from each other, but there's no direct uh, link for the two to interact directly. And uh, next slide, please. That's it. Uh, that's kind of all I had. Does anyone have any questions? We have Spencer in the queue. Please go ahead, Spencer. Thank you for uh, thank you for the presentation. I learned more than uh, you maybe thought I would have. Uh, do you have a sense right now of because I know this was a topic in mask adoption for the IP Connect, whether um, that's leaning more towards um, an IP address or an IP prefix. Um, do you, you understand um, my question? I, I think I do. Um, that's so. Uh, that is a question that we will resolve in the mask working group as part of okay. our work on the adopted re IP requirements draft. Uh, I believe that we have not yet answered this question. I have okay. thoughts on what I think, yeah. but I, I would take all that conversation to mask because uh, it's not really yeah. relevant to multipath. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I was as current as you were. 
Cool. Thanks, Spencer. And actually, can I ask you to file an issue on the um, uh, repository for the requirements document so we can make sure we track and discuss this? I will. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Christian. Christian Vitema. Uh, David, you say that uh, multipass is orthogonal to mask, but there is a point in which multipass and uh, tunneling interact, which is pass MTU. That is, uh, any application that runs over a VPN or over UDP proxy will have to do pass MTU. And uh, arguably, uh, multipass means that we have some packet with one MTU and some packet with another. Is it something that you plan considering in mask? Um, so the way I personally think about it is uh, that's also orthogonal to mask because even let's say if there is no, that, that's specific to quick, even if there is no mask involved and no multipath involved, I still need to do path MTU to know how, how many bytes I can fit per packet on my Wi-Fi interface. And if I could do a connection migration to cell, I need to redo path MTU discovery on that after that migration on the new interface. So I think that's a very important thing that needs to be done. But I think that's like a property of Quick that is specific to Quick and maybe you know even more exacerbated by connection migration. But I don't think uh, multipath nor mask change that. Well, uh, what I'm saying, David, is that if you do path MTU discovery in Quick. You do that, we have the mechanisms to do that on each pass. But if you do that on the aggregate of several paths, if, if something underneath aggregates several paths to the point that sometime you can send 1500 bytes and sometime you can send 1200, then Quick have a very hard time dealing with that. So either we say we are gonna actually work actively to support the scenario in mask or we don't. That, that that's a good point. I, I think that also applies to IP because your IP route could change, you know, over the network without you having any knowledge of it and could flap between things. But I agree with you that I, that is less likely that whereas when you have a proxy that is deliberately connection migrating or something, it could have it could flap more often. My intuition is to like maybe start off with something without it and see if it's a problem in real life. And if it becomes a real problem, then we solve the real problem. And so I, I could, my intuition, again, we'll have to think and discuss this more in the mask working group is that we could build a connect UDP extension that would perhaps like on a connection UDP flow say, oh, by the way, the path MTU changed to redo your PMTUD or, or something. So uh, I, I think we could do something. And I think that your, your point makes sense. Okay, next up, Jana. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, can I can. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, Jana Iyengar, thanks for the presentation, David. So uh, one question that's not clear to me, what you've shown here is that mask can use uh, multipath, and then multipath and mask, as Christian is pointing out, might have some interactions, but we can work on those. The question that I guess I'm trying to square away in my head is um, why would mask need multipath? This is more of an application. Uh, this is more of a what's driving the value here question. So when when you did mask or when you're doing mask now in the working group, there are certain use cases that are driving the the work that's happening in mask. Are those use cases going to be able to benefit from? No, so we didn't we didn't ask David to present because he thought that mask would benefit from from. Uh... Multipath. I, I agree. Can I just uh, quickly yeah, answer ahead, that, sorry. Lars? I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, so, uh, absolutely, I agree with both of you. I'm personally not yet convinced uh, that uh, mask would be measurably better with multipath. But I think part of the presentations that will follow this one, uh, I think some of them talk about why some people think that like. Multivas is important, so uh, I would lean on those presentations to answer that question. Okay, I appreciate that. I was trying. I, I guess I I had the wrong um, frame in my head when I was looking at the presentation. That helps. Yeah, there's a bunch of, of use cases that will follow now uh, shortly that that basically use quick as a as a tunnel, and and since mask is defining 
something like that, we thought it would be useful to have David present what Mask offers at the moment. Um, I, I chatted with Roberto, uh, with Roberto, <laughs> with Lucas uh, offline, and since uh, Roberto has to leave in half an hour, and we might be right in the middle of the uh, use cases, we're gonna like let you uh, say your thing now, Roberto, if you would, and then go to the use cases, so you can leave whenever you want to. Uh, thanks, and I really regret having to leave, by the way. Um, so the basic observation I'm going to make is uh, why is the connection the right place for multipath? Um, I think that historically we've chosen the connection as the place for multipath because of two reasons. Number one, we don't want to change a bunch of applications and have to require them to be aware all the time. Uh, so putting it down in the layer that is traditionally opaque has been useful. And number two, because the connection is just kind of evolved to be a proxy for the session that the application is trying to do. Um, and I think as a historical accident, that's all, that's all fine. I mean, things evolve those ways, that's normal. But I think that we have an opportunity to rethink this as well. And to think, if we look at some of the uses that we've seen and some of the reluctance that we've seen with people using multipath when it does exist and does work, um, I think a lot of that is because we are burying it behind something opaque instead of making it optionally opaque. Uh, an example, um, if I am to uh, do video, uh, it is one of those pretty obvious cases uh, where using the bandwidth from multiple paths simultaneously will be useful. Um, however, if I am worried about rebuffering, if I want to make sure that a, a video conference is not going to have stuttering, um, I need to do so in evaluation of the risks. If the multipath is happening in the connection under, underneath everything and I cannot see it or really adjust it, it's going to be difficult to trust that it's going to do the right thing, especially with any of the other feedback mechanisms. So I might actually do substantially better if what I have instead is something that gets me an ability to route to the same server to establish a session that both the client and the server understand irrespective of whether whether it is the same connection or not that it is the same session um, and you can still put this behind an opaque barrier and call it a connection if you wish but i believe that having that option to have multiple connections and establish a session is fundamentally more powerful in the end. It allows us to do things with applications that the applications would probably be more likely to do. And that's it. That's all I have. Um, I just would love for us to think about is, are, are we putting multipath in the right place? Um, you know, multipath is about muxing and demuxing like uh, other uh, things. Uh, it's just that we're muxing and demuxing onto connections. And do we want, oh, sorry, onto paths, and do we want those to be associated with the connection or somewhere higher up? And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. All right. Uh, with that, we're going to start um, on the, the use cases. And um, we thought historically, since, since uh, Chromium has experimented with this, um, we would uh, take that presentation first. I think it's uh, Fan and Jana together, right? I'll run it from here. I think I'll run everything from here. It's easier. And you guys tell me next slide. Uh, thanks, Lars. I'm sorry. Um, Jana Iyengar, I, I'll, I'm just going to take like 30 seconds to introduce Fan. So this is uh, a presentation that um, Fan Yang at Google is, is going through, going to go through. Uh, his, so Fan implemented multipath in Chrome. This was a few years ago. Um, and and he drove the the implementation and uh, the design. However, is is some of what he's going to go through. the The point of this presentation is not so much to talk about the design, but to talk about the experience of having gone through this in quick uh, once. Now, of course, the experiences will vary as implementations tend to be different, and the design here is only one. All of this is just one data point in the space of uh, designing and implementing multipath in quick, but it's relevant. Therefore, it's here. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Fan. Thanks, Fan. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, yeah, I'm Fan Yang. I'm, work, I'm working uh, Google Quick Team, uh, and uh, this is the multipass work back in 2016. Uh, work with Jenna and Yin. Um, so that's so that's the experience and the challenge we're facing. So uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, so here is a high level design. So um, back in 2016, of course, there's no ITF Quick. So um, the Modipass is designed for Google Quick. Um, so GQuick does not have, you know, multiple connection IDs. So we use pass ID to identify a path. Um, and uh, for each pass, there is a packet number space. So to identify a packet, we use pass ID plus packet number. Um, and design is we use the unified act frame. So basically, the act frame will contain the packets received on all the paths. So uh, the expectation is the acknowledgement will come back from the soonest, uh, fastest pass. And also, of course, we use separate connection controller and uh, loss detection per pass. Uh, of course, retransmissions could go over on different paths than, origin than original. So next slide, please. Um, so back in the time, the implementation is a little challenging, um, especially because our uh, how our code is written that time. Uh, that time, I think, so when one packet is declared lost, so we basically we put out the frames and re-serialize to a separate packet. And then we use a struct to record the connection between the two packets. Uh, for example, one packet gets act, we consider both of them gets acknowledged. So that becomes more challenging if we will retransmit packets, you know, across paths. Uh, we need to uh, build an even more compl complicated uh, struct to record the connections between packets spreading uh, multiple paths. Um, but now I think the, the implementation is easier because we get rid of the connection between packets. Uh, we only record the, the, uh, the content in the packet, for example, uh, when a packet gets acknowledged, so we will report to the corresponding stream, say, hey, uh, this bunch of stream data has been acknowledged instead of a packet. Um, so uh, that being said, the, the implementation can be very difficult, but depending on your implementation. So next slide, please. Um, so yeah, the next one uh, we're facing is scheduling. I think that's exactly as Roboto said. Uh, we decide to put the motive has in the connection. So that's what we are facing this, I mean, challenging scheduling problem because you will never figure out, uh, I mean, a, a appropriate or good scheduler without knowing what, uh, what the application want. For example, um, the application want to minimize latency, we may put packets always on the uh, path with shortest RTT. Or if the, if the uh, application cares about Bandwidth, we will dumping packet to all available paths. Or, I mean, uh, the application cares about data user, data plan, so we can only send packets on the Wi Fi, maybe very, you know, um, important data on, on cellular. Or the, the application is very, um, you know, um, sensitive to packet loss, for example, the audio trans, uh, transmission. So w then we may put, I mean, redundancy, I mean, send the same packets over multiple paths. So without the knowledge, I don't know, so how. It's, it's, it's so hard to, to develop a scheduler, I mean, which can be used for all kind of applications. And also, I mean, uh, inside Google, so we have never um, have a buying from a customer saying, hey, I want this kind of scheduler and uh, I want multi-pass because connection migration cannot meet my uh, requirement. We have never um, seen that uh, requirement. So basically what we always heard is, why don't you improve connection migration first and see if it's enough? Uh, so um, uh, inside Google, we have uh, put much effort uh, to uh, make connection migration work. Um, so that's pretty good, actually. So next slide, please. So here is the lessons we learned. So because after facing these challenges and uh, the implementation complexity and lacking of use cases, uh, so we basically removed the, the, the code from the, from the Chromium repository. Uh, so the lessons learned is the multipass increases code complexity. Uh, yeah, this can be uh, small, or huge, depending upon the implementation. And uh, you know, scheduling is hard and depends on the use case. So if you if you are not working closely with uh, application, you are likely to fail. Um, and also, I mean, most use case um, only need connection migration. I think the good example is um, um, Android Google Search app. Uh, so we deploy connection migration there, and uh, 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 so they're happy and they're not uh, asking for multipass. Um, I think that's it. Any any questions? Yes, we have Spencer in the queue first. I'd like to remind people that we do have a lot of presentations today, so if they could keep comments or questions as short as possible, that would be appreciated. Please go ahead, Spencer. Uh, I would uh, 
I, I could reasonably ask if you think that connect, you're, you're saying connection migration works well enough so you, you don't have to have, you're, you, you know, thinking about multipath now might make sense if multipath makes sense where it didn't previously. But I think I'm also hearing you say what Roberto was saying about um, the more you know about uh, what you're doing, you know, the more you know about what you're doing with multipath, the better job you can do rather than uh, being a general purpose transport. Thank you. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's kind of, uh, so basically my understanding is we really need a, I mean, killing use case saying, hey, connection migration does not meet our our, our requirement. We really want to use, use multipass and they will uh, closely work with us for developing a scheduler which meets their requirement. Um, so to my experience, that, that never happens inside of Google. So that's why we, uh, we decided not to go for multipass in Chromium. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, next. Fan, good to see you again. Just a quick question. Do you think the new uh, architecture for retransmissions being in the stream instead of in the packets, do you think that would simplify the implementation to the point that it would be straightforward, or do you think it would still be huge? Hey, Ryan, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, totally. I think that will simplify the implementation a lot because, you know, we, we now we only record the stream data, so there's completely no connection between packets spanning multiple paths. So we exactly know. So the stream has no idea. You know, uh, I send data to which pass to which packet number. It does not care. It the only cares is, hey, this stream data has been acknowledged. I can remove it, or this stream data is lost. I will retransmit it. So the impl implementation should be much much easier. Thank you, Rai. Thanks, Ben. And next we have Igor. Hey, um, so I heard a lot that you were talking to many clients at Google, so Google Storage, Google other uh, client applications. I wonder if you had any conversations with server people, uh, if they were ever interested in uh, connection migration or multipath on the server side, like, for example, um, YouTube, I'm just guessing, right? I mean, some connection comes to one server, but the object is really in a different one. We want to migrate to the one that has it. Uh, any conversations like that? Yeah, we did have. So actually, I'm working on the uh, server side of in the quick team. So um, I think we have previously a use case we think about is exactly said, hey, the server will send out the preferred address after, you know, uh, finish the handshake saying, hey, client, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can talk to me uh, to this preferred address. And then at the time, the client basically have two address to talk about this kind of multipath, but it's still talk to the same server. But anyway, um, so but that, uh, to my knowledge, that does not work uh, greatly with our infrastructure. So that's why we gave up on that idea. But 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 that put on hold. We can totally revisit it later. So. That that does that answer your question? Yeah, that's thank you. Thank you. Okay, and the queue is empty for this presentation. Cool, thank you. Thank and you. I'm trying to set up Christoph. Who is next? All right, Christoph, go ahead. You you have an interesting yeah. slide format. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, WebEx shows me as, as still on mute. Uh, do you are you bringing up the slides? I can't see them at the moment. I can. I think I'm showing them. Um, yes, we can see okay, them. No. Okay, okay, great. I think some. Tell me next slide. Then, um, whether someone says yes. Okay. So hello, I'm uh, Christoph from Apple, and uh, yeah, I have been working on multipath transports for uh, a long time. So I'm going to show a little bit about the use cases we have here at Apple. Uh, next slide. So our first use case that we have that we have for now seven years, um, it's um, Siri that is using multipath TCP. Um, with Siri, we are pursuing uh, certain goals with our use of multipath. Um, first of all, Siri is a very latency sensitive application, right? 
whenever the user is talking to Siri, he wants to get the response as quick as possible. So the first goal is, of course, to minimize latency as much as possible to get the best user experience, especially in the high percentiles. And secondly, of course, we also want to reduce network errors. Um, what is tricky with Siri is that it is building up state on the server as the user is speaking. So it's not, it is a connection that is hard to recover, right? When the connection is lost, there's basically um, the, the only way to recover it is by sending all the data yet again. So that um, means that uh, we try very hard to reduce network errors with Siri because it's so costly to reestablish a TCP connection. The environment in which Siri is running is a thin bidirectional stream. So that means uh, the application is sending small amounts of data in a, in a regular, very short time frame. Uh, let's say, for example, 100 bytes every 20 milliseconds, for example. And the server keeps on responding. So it's very interactive traffic. It's not a bulk data transfer. And finally, um, Siri is also often used in mobile environments where people are walking out of the home. So the, the traditional um, Wi-Fi fading away scenario is very frequent because um, people use it when they walk out of their home and say, hey, Siri, uh, turn off my lights or whatever, right? Um, next slide. So this is the setting where we are in for Siri. Next slide. Uh, the way we use multipath is, first of all, when we create a Siri connection, we establish immediately the TCP subflows on both Wi-Fi and cell. So even if Wi-Fi is in a very good state, uh, we immediately are basically warming up the cellular link as well. This enables us to basically switch from Wi-Fi to cell without having to go through a TCP handshake. Right? We can immediately start sending and also start receiving, of course, data on the cellular link. And uh, it also primes us with an initial RTT measurement. So that way we know at least we have the Wi-Fi link quality, a certain RTT, and we also have an RTT measurement for the, for the cellular link. So we have then those two paths that are ready. And then we start, start scheduling traffic into what we call the interactive mode. So there's one note that I want to make is uh, we, we publish the multipath transport APIs um, a few years back in different scheduling modes uh, that we, from our experience, are most useful to the applications. We have handover mode and interactive mode and the aggregation mode. And so Siri is using the hand interactive mode because it's a thin stream, a lot, a lot of data, but very latency sensitive, okay? So um, when we're sending, we are continuously evaluating the path characteristics. We are looking at the RTT and packet loss. And for every single packet that we are transmitting, we decide what is the most optimal path on that particular moment in time. And the best path is basically RTT based. We choose the one with the lowest RTT. Um, now, if, for example, retransmissions are happening on one path, we then uh, schedule traffic on the other path to basically quickly overcome the, um, the, uh, the delay that is introduced by a retransmission, right? because the retransmission needs to be, um, it can be blocking the congestion window. Um, and so what can happen is basically, for example, if you Christopher, have- Christopher, I think a, you need to speed a up a little bit, sorry. Yeah, okay, I'll speed up. So then, next slide. Okay, so what are the quick requirements for Siri? It is a continuous measurement of path quality to know what is happening and the ability to switch between paths in a sub RTT time frame. Uh, for example, if I'm getting packet loss on Wi Fi, the next packet will not be sent on Wi Fi, but it will be sent on cellular, just because I want to avoid the um, latency that is introduced by your retransmission. Um, and also, another point is yes, the wireless and the cellular characteristics can change in very short time frames. So, this is important that we are able to switch uh, in sub RTT time frames from one path to the other. Uh, next slide. Apple Music. So the goal with Apple Music is that um, we try to reduce the playback stalls. And we also, if we still stall, we try to reduce the duration of the stall. The, the environment that we have is we have a bulk data transfer where we are transmitting the entire song to the device in one bulk transfer. And we also have a playback buffer that hides actually most networking issues. 
Next slide. So what we are trying to do here, because music can transmit very large amounts of data, right? We try to minimize cellular data usage as much as possible. That's the, that's the ultimate goal. Um, and so how we do it is by, we, we avoid cellular data at all cost only when we are getting close to having a problem in the music streaming. And that's when we then bring up the cellular link and then we are, because we are very close to, to basically having a music stall, that's when we try uh, transmitting data on both paths as fast as possible because we want to avoid the, this music stall from happening. So here what we do is we do actually re resource pooling to aggregate both paths. Um, next slide. So the quick requirements here are basically is the resource pooling a requirement because we want to send on both paths. And the reason for that is because we want to really minimize cellular data usage to avoid uh, causing bill shocks for the clients. And those are Apple's use cases. I'm open to questions now. Okay, we're, we're a little bit over time. So if people could keep this brief, I'm gonna cut the queue in a few seconds. So get in if you want to. Uh, we'll start with David, please. Yes, um, David Skenazi, Google. Um, Hi, Christoph. Thanks, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I think it's really great that you split things out in terms of, okay, here are the things that um, Apple cares about for these services and, you know, requirements on Quick. Um, my question for you on, like, seeing most of your requirements on Quick, uh, they seem to be already covered by Quick and um, connection migration. Do you have an idea of uh, what things are actually require multipath i know like for apple music if you're doing bonding and sending on both but i i think that's the only one i saw well for the first one what we do is and I, i'm not sure if that's really possible with quick migration is switching paths at a sub milli, sub rtt time scale right yes so the, the the trick is you need to like validate both paths similar to mptcp you need to you'd call that establishing the subflows but then once you've done that, you can like migrate very often. There's nothing preventing you from doing that. Uh, with one requirement is on the, it has to be a, today, it has to be decided, uh, the client is the one migrating. So it has to be client initiated. But from my understanding of the Apple stack, that's what you prefer because the client knows the cost of the interfaces and all that better than the server does. So one thing to say is switching paths at sub RTT timeframes, right? If, I, if there's a 100 millisecond RTT and I switch the path every millisecond, that is basically resource pooling. So I'm not sure that if quick migration is able to do this, right? Because we would need at each time we switch, we need to uh, switch the congestion control. Uh, I know that Christian has a draft way. He says it's possible to do that. But I would like sure. to punt that part of the discussion to the to the general discussion because so the, the point was clarification on the presentation and now we're doing clarification on quick which was I think other use cases will have these questions can quick do this right so I think that would be best handled at the end thank you all right my apologies thanks for the answer Gustav yep. okay next up Matt Joris hey Matt Joris Facebook um, Echoing also, I thought it was a good presentation. My question is brief, pretty brief. To, you mentioned Apple Music. Um, have, has App, does Apple have any experience doing non-music streaming, like um, you know, video streaming? Because I ask because I do think the considerations are a bit different. Um, because you know, music data can be very very small, whereas even a very a modestly sized video will be larger than an entire song, and I think it kind of exacerbates a lot of the policy problems that I see, like, you know, the, you said you want to minimize cellular data use, and I think that's a noble goal, but I think that's somewhat easier to do when you're, like, you're, you're the, the phone provider as opposed to an, another application. So, like, for us, for example, if you're using a Facebook app, communicating the fact that we're going to do this thing where we use both interfaces, I think is difficult, especially for things like video. So I was just curious if you'd done things that were more data intensive than uh, music and Siri. Yeah. yeah, we haven't investigated. I mean, we looked at uh, video. Uh, one problem with video, except especially with adaptive bit rates, is that 
um, it, it is estimating the uh, bit rate that it is getting. And so it could get confused by multipath. That's why we didn't go down that road at the time. Also, because we didn't have the time. Um, in terms of data usage, that is always a problem. And the system usually imposes restrictions on that. At least for our multipath use cases, we have Wi-Fi assist that is limiting the cellular data usage of each application when Wi-Fi is available. Um, and so that's like our system that is like the police that, that mandates, okay, you are allowed to use cellular data now, and you can only use 100 megabytes, and you're not going to be able to use more. Okay, let's move on quickly then. Thank you. Uh, Jana, please. Um, hi, Jana Yengar. Thanks, Christoph. Uh, same thing. It's really useful to see where these things are being used, and it's good to see you as always. Um, so uh, the, I have two questions. Uh, one on S the Siri, you mentioned uh, switching back and forth between multiple parts at the sub RTD time scales. Um, do you do that more than once per RTD? I would imagine not because you would have to switch, wait for feedback, and then switch again. So I would imagine that you're probably switching at um, uh, uh, the highest rate you would be switching is once per RTD. Is that, I have two questions, but that's the first one. Yeah. The highest rate is once per RTT of the lowest RTT subflow. Yeah. Of course, that makes yeah. sense. Um, um, go ahead, yeah. So that, that, I, th I think that just to uh, echo something that David said earlier, it does put a cap on how, how, how you think about resource pooling here, because you're not switching at uh, millisecond times, uh, you're not switching at packet time scales. Um, the second question was on music, and, and I'm echoing Martin. What Martin asked on the chat on the uh, chat channel: uh, When you do pool, when you do resource pool, are you sending the same data over uh, multiple paths, or are you are you just like trying to utilize both paths bandwidth maximizing for that short? Yeah, we time? are maximizing the bandwidth. We use the scheduler that we that is defined in uh, one of the drafts that we submitted to ICCRG. Um, which is basically, it, it's a scheduler designed to optimize throughput, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, and we'll move on to Olivier for the last question on this. Uh, yes, Christophe, thank you for the presentation. Um, You're very soft, I, Olivier. Okay, so thank you for the presentation. Do you hear me? Still very yeah. far away. Yeah. Then let's move to the next one. I will. Okay, thank you. Hello, hello, Lars. I think we need to share from our side. Uh, you can. I can also run it from here if you prefer. Uh, let me share. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see now. So Yeme and uh, I mean Yunfei, Yeme and I will present for Alibaba use cases. Go ahead. Let's start. Um, hi everyone, I'm Yame from Alibaba. My colleague Yunfei and I will introduce the use cases in Alibaba's ecosystems. Uh, next page, please. Uh, these use cases include new retail e-commerce use cases and the mobility use cases. Uh, then we will talk about some 5G and beyond. There will be a summary of the requirements for the path management and the package scheduler in Multipass Quick and a demo video of our deployed version of Multipass Quick in Taobao. Next, please. The, the first use case in Alibaba uh, is the Taobao mobile application. Taobao is the most popular online shopping application in China. And instead of just showing a picture, it uses short form videos to display the product information. Today, Taobao already uh, uses Quick and HTTP3 for video downloading. Reducing startup delay and stalling time is critical. So we employ Multipass Quick, which uses both Wi-Fi and IoT at the same time. The main purpose is to accelerate video downloading and reduce stalling and rebuffering. With better quality of experience, our customers are more willing to buy the products. In the meantime, we use Multipass Quick to accelerate the video up uploading so the video creators and the bloggers are, are more willing to upload their new works on our platform and will attract more users. Next, please. 
the the sec the second use case is Taobao Live. It's like uh, Amazon Live. Uh, more and more streamers and internet internet ce celebrities stream outdoors. In picture two, a streamer stream outdoor in his orchard. He is showing a jujube just picked from the tree and telling the customers how delicious the jujube tastes. The problem is that sometimes the uplink is very slow. So we want to help the streamers to stream outdoors with multipass quick to use more bandwidth through two disjoint network links. The streamers can use a mobile phone with LTE from carrier one and use a mobile Wi-Fi hotpot to connect to carrier two at the, in the same time. Another strong need to deploy multipass is a high mobility application scenario. So one notable example is a high speed rail in China. In the year 2019, there are over 2 billion passenger railway journeys. However, because a train is moving at a speed over 300 kilometers per hour, handovers between base stations happen every 13 seconds. So even though the train is equipped with, with Wi-Fi, today the internet experience is far from satisfactory. And with MPQuick, a user can use his or her cellular and the train's Wi-Fi at the same time. And so they, and they can also connect to mo multiple mobile carriers, which helps the mobility issue. And the apps uh, from Ali ecosystem that can benefit from doing so are Taobao and Alipay for online shopping, Intalk for business collaboration and communication, and Yuku for entertainment for customers who want to use these apps on the road. And the last thing we want to talk about is 5G coverage. So China right now is rolling out 5G sub 6 gigahertz, but the 5G operates on higher frequency. So the percentage of 5G NSA coverage host is larger compared to 4G. On the right side shows a measurement study where the pink color areas indicate the spot 5G signals are too weak to communicate. And in comparison, the 5G coverage host is 8% versus 1.7% in 4G when the space station have the same density. So MPQuick become, uh, becomes a solution to address this issue with possible simple in-app customization. And in summary, we present some of the MP user cases right now Alibaba has major interest in, and two things we want to emphasize in this presentation. First, uh, in our implementation, we build multipass quick over bidirectional subconnection concept, and this makes things simple and enable the use of most quick trans transport design. And second, we employ a dynamic scheduling strategy with feedback to optimize performance. And I also want to echo uh, Fan Yang just from Google just said, so scheduling, we found that is really important because uh, in order to utilize MP, uh, we that need to understand what the application wants. And so we, in our design, we use the dynamic scheduling strategy, which allows the client and server interaction to support application awareness. And before conclusion, uh, here is a, a demo where we have integrated the MP Quick into Taobao and the Ali Cloud CDN, uh, which is the largest shopping app in China. And we contrast the MP Quick on the left with, with the single pass quick on the right. As is shown, MP Quick is effective in offering much smaller startup delay and much less stalling. With that, I would like to conclude the, the talk and we are happy to take questions. Thank you. You talked about high speed trains and that was a high speed talk. Thank you. Um, I don't see anyone in the queue. Does, does anyone want to jump in um, when we have the opportunity? I have a quick uh, clarification question. When you say MP quick, you, you actually mean draft a conic, right? The, the, you, you using that or are you using MP quick as a short uh, for multipath quick? Uh, I use MP quick as a short for multipath quick. Okay, thank you. I was going to ask the same because some other slides also have MP quick on it and, and um, often that's that is used as a, as a you know acronym for multipath uh, quick, but it's also the name of one particular proposal, which makes it a little bit confusing. Thank you. That was a good talk. We have Jana in the queue now. Uh, Jana Yengar, um, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that talk. I, I'm 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 trying to. There are a number of things that I'm missing here. So so maybe you could help me understand this. I didn't fully grok. So these are all using some form of multipath quick, which you which you clarified that is not actually the draft that we have out there. Uh, but what's the server, what's the client, and are you using this in production? Those are three questions just about the setup that you have here. 
we have you. Uh, let, um, let them answer the three questions first, Jana. <laughs> fair enough. Oh, okay, I, I can answer that one by one. So, so the, the first question is okay. So about about the deployment, right? So the first thing is we uh, deploy the protocol in both the our Ali Cloud CDN and also the, the the client, right? The client are the apps such as the Taobao, right? It's a, like Amazon is an online shopping app, and this is how the deployment is made. Uh, this, this is the first question. Oh, so what are the next question? Are you using this in production right now? Are users actually using this, or was this a demo? Uh, so we have a small scale deployment, and we are trying to experiment in with the MP Quick um, right now. So this is already a, a production. Um, yeah, but 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 we are experimenting. So right now, the so some of the user can get access to MP Quick, but not all of them. Um, sure. So, have you have you uh, uh, experimented with connection migration in Quick? Uh, yes, we have experimented with connection migration. So, uh, one issue we found that is so sometimes let, let's say right. So, the, the connection connection is not great. The connection is just the bandwidth is not enough. For example, for the the uh, the uh, Taobao Live uh, streaming case, right? So we have many celebrity, internet celebrity who lives on streaming and they want to do streaming all doors. And what they find out is they care a lot about performance because they make money on that, right? So they want to make sure that their internet is very stable. And 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 and, and so that, that's why they want to have multiple uplink, especially in some area, in rural area in China, right, where the uplink interconnectivity is not very good. So if we deploy MP Quick, this gives them opportunity to uh, double their bandwidth. So th that's one use cases, and the other use cases is about the high speed train, right? Because I think the LTE and 4G they already have uh, done a lot of job in doing the handover, right? So, but the the, the thing is the high speed train is travel so fast. So when you have handover every like ten seconds, right? It's, uh, um, still difficult to make sure that the internet connectivity is good. And and because the high-speed train, right now there is a high-speed train Wi-Fi. And it, it so the Wi-Fi works like this. It has a hotspot inside the carriage. It also has an antenna outside the, the, the train, which can connect to the cellular. But the thing is, there are so many people sharing the same Wi-Fi in the same carriage. So everyone gets a very limited bandwidth so what they want to do is they say, okay, I also have the cellular, so why can I use both the Wi-Fi and my own cellular at the same same time? So, and then our design is is made to uh, for the need of this customer. We gotta speed up a little bit with the questions and the answers, please, guys. No, I'm gonna be. I'm, I'm gonna. I, I just. I would love to see uh, more details on what actually you're doing here, because I. I you said you're not doing the draft. Uh, but you're doing your own thing. And I'd be very, very much curious to understand exactly what you're doing. So if you were able to publish a draft or something like that, that would be super useful. Oh, okay. okay, so yeah, the, the draft link is, is here. So you can you can see, so we attach the draft link in the slide. So if you're uh, okay. interested, you can, you can take a look. All right, thank you. And Jana, there's an X quick uh, channel on Slack, which is their implementation, which I think they're planning to open source at some point this year. Thanks for that. Okay, we have David left in the queue. If you could keep it brief, please, David. Yes, very quick. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Two short questions. Uh, first one, was this uh, MP Quick end-to-end -end from the client to server, or was it with a proxy involved? Uh, it's end-to-end, MP Quick end-to-end. Cool. Thank you. Second question, uh, you mentioned like users care about performance. I totally agree. Um, what specifically do you mean? You mentioned uh, bandwidth. So I see you've measured that and you've shown results. Uh, did you also measure latency and things like that? Uh, yes, we have this latency measurement, but it's not shown in this slides. But, but it's not making it worse is I guess my question. Um, Yes, yes. So, so the, the, I, I think one thing I want to emphasize here is so in different area, right, the latency can vary. So especially when you uh, use Wi-Fi and LTE, it probably goes through different ISP, right? So and, 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 and based on the measurement, and sometimes you need to adjust 
uh, scheduling policies. That's why um, I, I, I think the design a good scheduler for MP quick is the most important thing. Oh, absolutely agree. Because for some use cases, all you care about is throughput. In that case, you know, that's great. But I think for a lot of them, latency is important. So that's why I just was wondering what kind of numbers you had. But awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next is uh, Jörg. I'll run it from here if that's okay. And you tell me next slide. Yeah, sure, fine. Yeah, hello, everyone. My name is Jörg Deutschmann. We have a use case which improves the situation for users which suffer from poor internet connectivity. The idea is basically to combine a slow terrestrial link with a geostationary satellite one. So the terrestrial link offers low latency while the satellite one offers high data rates. Uh, the architecture which we have at the moment relies on TCP proxies, which has some advantages for us. First, multipath is limited to the access network, so between both paths we have more or less perfect knowledge of both link characteristics. Second, the links between the paths are provisioned statically, and uh, like so often, the scheduling is the difficult part. With split TCP, the paths can aggregate data from TCP senders, which we then use as scheduling decision. We also switch at sub-RTT levels, but given that the RTT of the satellite link is something like 600 milliseconds, that's not too surprising. And uh, of course, we also allow bandwidth aggregation. There are some performance evaluation results in the appendix of these slides, but there is no need to discuss them here and now, I guess. So next slide. Now. With Quick, there are no transparent TCP proxies anymore, so we thought about how we could realize our use case end-to-end -end with Quick. We came up with the following requirements. Uh, first, and probably the most important one, before the satellite link can be utilized in a multi-path scenario, it should perform well in a single-path scenario. Um, second, there is the need for fine-grained scheduling among both links. Uh, I don't know if connection migration would be sufficient for this. Again, scheduling for such link combination is quite difficult. Even both paths are, uh, paths are, ava are available simultaneously. It might also be good if, for example, up frames are always sent via the terrestrial link, while stream data is split among both paths. Um, the next point is that we would like to use the satellite links as soon as possible. So in the best case, we would set up the quick connection for each pass with zero RTT. Uh, anyway, we didn't test the multipath quick implementation yet, so I really cannot tell how good our use case will perform in an end-to-end -end setup. We also thought about multipath and mask proxies, but we neither have results for this yet. Um, from an architecture point of view, this is a hybrid access network with difficult link characteristics. So I think we will see a similar figure in the presentation about hybrid access networks. Next slide. A remark that in future there will be more kinds of internet access links, especially low earth satellite constellations. I think this is a motivation for multipath in general. And finally, there is a paper and an internet draft which contains some more information. So I'd be happy to receive your feedback on this use case, and that's it from my side. Thank you. Uh, we uh, have a question from Matt Juras. Yeah, um, just to clarify, for this use case, th this is essentially like a proxying tunnel use case, right, where the, where the, End user application is not aware of the tunnel. Is that pretty much right? Yeah, correct. That was just my question. Okay. Um, in that case, we'll move on to Christian, please. Just a clarifying question about uh, this uh, talk of, of satellite proxies. Is that a, a deployed product or is that a research project? Not yet. Uh, this is the outcome of a research project, and we're starting with some field tests uh, next. And yeah, so and we also have to do tests with multipath quick first. So we're, I guess, in a very very early stage, unfortunately.
Does this answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, we, we don't have any more in the queue. So I think, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I think we can move on and take some time back. Yep, Olivier's uh, next. Let's hope the audio is better. Olivier, can you try? Uh, yes, is it better? It's perfect, thank you. I'll run it from here if you like. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> So um, the idea is to inform you about the hybrid access networks use case and the requirements that this solution puts on Multipass Quick. Uh, next slide. So the, the use case is that uh, there are hybrid access routers, so hybrid CPEs that have uh, DSL and 4G connectivity. And these are deployed in the field. And when, as a user, you have this kind of device, basically what you get usually is that you can use either DSL or 4G, and you use 4G as, as a backup, while the user would like to be able to use both DSL and 4G, especially in rural areas, where you don't have uh, enough connectivity, enough performance from the DSL network. Next slide. So I will discuss the MPTCP-based library access networks that are deployed, and then I will look at MPQuick in these uh, scenarios. Next slide. So the currently deployed solutions uh, work with multipass TCP, and so they combine the wide access networks, which is uh, typically DSL, with a wireless access network, which is typically LTE. And there are specifications from Broadband Forum and, and, and uh, IATF with MPTCP. Next slide. Yes, so the solution, um, allows end users to use regular TCP, so single pass TCP. And there is a transparent proxy on the hybrid access router that would uh, proxy the connection so that it becomes a multi-pass TCP connection that goes over the DSL and the 4G network. And it goes through a specific device in the a specific proxy, which is called the hybrid access gateway in the operator's networks that does the conversion between MPTCP and TCP so that it uh, speaks TCP to the external servers. And that's similar as an architecture to the protocols that are used for ATSS in 5G that Spencer will mention later on. Uh, next slide. So what are the benefits of multipass TCP in these hybrid access networks? Uh, the main benefit is that it provides bandwidth aggregation, which is key for uh, the low and the medium bandwidth speed networks that exist in many, uh, in many countries and in many regions uh, throughout the world. And one advantage is that the congestion control allows to automatically adjust uh, the bandwidth to the network capacity and sense the available capacity. And the operators that have deployed this solution, usually they want to prioritize DSL over the LT network. And so they do this using two different techniques. The first one is the pass manager, which is the algorithm that decides when to create a subflow over one specific pass. And so they can delay the creation of the LTE subflow if the DSL link is not fully used. And then there is an algorithm which is called the, the packet level scheduler that operates at the packet transmission level and that prefers the DSL pass over the LTE one. Next slide. So now let's look at what MPQuick could do in a grid access network and what it would bring with the requirements. I think that there are there would be two bene three benefits with multipass quick. Uh, in hybrid access networks. First is that uh, by leveraging the datagram extension from, uh, from Quick, it's possible to provide bandwidth aggregation for non-TCP flows uh, using MPQuick. The second is that MPQuick could be an over-the-top solution that would aggregate bandwidth for any combination of different access links, even from different ISPs uh, going through an hybrid access gateway that would run in the cloud. And the third advantage is that, well, MPQuick would be implemented in user space, which would not require kernel changes in the access routers. Next slide. So what are the requirements for MPQuick in these kind of networks? I think the requirements are that you need to be able to learn the availability of different paths and addresses. And on mobile devices, these paths and addresses can change over time. It should be possible to start and stop using a pass. It means that you need to have a pass manager, which is the intelligence that decides when and how, how to create subflows. It must provide aggregation, so you need to be able to simultaneously send packets over the two paths, or sometimes more paths than that. 
In some scenarios, you want to prefer some paths over others, so you need a packet scheduler, and you need to be able to sense the performance of the different paths by using ping frames, congestion control, and other techniques so that you can uh, you have varying capacity paths that you want to aggregate. Next slide. And the, la the last slide is that with MPQuick, we could even think a solution where you don't really need a proxy on the hybrid access router. And with MPQuick, you could have end-to-end -end MPQuick from the client to the server, provided that there is a way for the router to provide, to tell the end host that there are multiple paths available. And one way to do that would be to use the uh, PA multi-homing solution, which is being developed within the FTGWG working group, where basically you advertise two different IPv6 prefixes to the end host, one attached to the red network and one attached to the green network. And with that, I think I've covered uh, what I could cover in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. Um, we have Matt Trouris in the queue and nobody else. If you want to get in the queue, please do now. I'll be cutting it. Absolutely. Matt, please go ahead. So I have a hypothetical question. So if I am an end application that is already natively using Quick, not necessarily MP Quick, would this sort of setup transparently to me uh, essentially tunnel my connection over two paths without either the client or the server knowing? So today, if you use TCP, it would be transparent for you. If you use Quick, it's likely going over a single one of the two paths. Right, but what if I what if I was using Quick with this MP Quick proxy? Because you said datagrams would be forwarded over both. I, so but, would, would that so so then you could uh, you could send the, the Quick datagrams as data over the two paths. All right, that answers my question. Thank you. We have David. Please go ahead. Uh, sorry, waiting for it to unmute there. Uh, David Skenazi, Google. Um, just to kind of build up on uh, Matt's question, um, Olivier, when you um, send uh, the quick packets in over datagram frames on both, um, you won't have access to the quick packet numbers. So because of the different latencies on the different paths, you can introduce a lot of reordering, which, you know, we know as with TCP causes problems. Have you implement this, implemented this and measured uh, if it causes any performance problems? So we, we've done some experiments with that. So it's it works and there are there is other works that looks at uh, putting timestamp and other information to be able to reorder uh, the quick packets or other packets at the, at the, pro, at the, the, the server side so that you can avoid uh, resequencing if it causes problems. Ah, I see. So, so you would actually like artificially delay received packets to put them back in order. Um, interesting. Uh, I've I, I've seen that cause issues in TCP, but we haven't uh, tried that uh, with Quick. Yeah, it really depends on the implementation. So we looked uh, one year ago at Quick implementations, and they did not cope well with uh, reordering. Uh, while TCP implementation would cope much better with reordering, at least when looking at the recent Linux TCP implementation. And um, I guess some quick implementation have, have evolved now and they, they deal better with reordering than what they did one or two years ago. So this is changing quickly. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're done for the questions there. Thanks again, Olivier. Uh, we can move on to the next. All right, that's the 3GPP ATS SSS presentation, uh, triple S. I don't know who's talking to these slides or if it's a combination, so I'll run them from here and you guys speak. Cool, and I, uh, Spencer is at least starting. Thank you, thank you, Lars. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanna be sure and mention that, that uh, this is not us being the ATS SSS whisperer um, and we're, not wearing any 3GPP or ITF hats. Uh, we have some links here that people may find helpful. Uh, and I will uh, go to the next slide, please. So I really want to talk uh, not so much about ATS uh, as ATS, but as a multipath path uh, 
technology and uh, ATSS uh, uses only two paths, one 3GPP, one non 3GPP uh, in their in their work. Uh, they get uh, rules and that assigns uh, nodes uh, modes for flow. Uh, the the vocabulary that they use, which I think is helpful, is uh, steering is selecting a path, switching is selecting a different path, and splitting is using multiple paths simultaneously. Uh, so. On the for the figure on the right, please look at what's in purple, not what's in black. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, what, what we're talking about, what I'm talking about in my presentation is the combination of things from ATSSS and a, enhanced ATSSS. Um, so there's this basically. Uh, a ATSSS uh, is two different protocols. One is using MPTCP. One is using uh, traffic aggregation without any spe specific protocol between the uh, tunnel endpoints. Um, what they've been able to achieve so far um, has been for for non TCP traffic has been steering and switching only. What they're uh, trying to do in uh, in enhanced ATSSS is uh, splitting for non TCP traffic of any IP and Ethernet traffic. And they're also talking about um, support for additional um, ET, e ATSS uh, modes uh, beyond what's, what's, in, uh, what's in ATSSS uh, initially. Next slide, please. So uh, this is basically this is basically just to say uh, this is uh, these are this is the tunneling prox slash proxying. Uh, they have proposals to do both of those um, from from the combination of of what's in what's in ATSSS and e ATSSS. Um, but wanted but wanted to just say basically these are you know these are the uh, the endpoints between the user equipment and the, the, the tunnel endpoint uh, before you get to servers. Um, when we say MP to quick, uh, I'm really talking about multipath quick. Uh, this picture is out of uh, a, a 3GPP uh, document, so uh, we didn't we didn't change the the labels, but. Uh, don't don't pay a lot of attention to that detail. Um, and, um, next, next slide, please. Oh, uh, just a minute. So just to mention the, uh, campus enterprise use case, this, this is, this is very much the, uh, similar to the, um, uh, to the, um, uh, hybrid, uh, access, um, Use case that uh, Olivier uh, presented very capably, and uh, just with some additional details on benefits for the user and for the access provider. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the ATSSS modes; these are already deployed. Uh, active standby and smallest delay based on RTT and. Uh, Load balancing. Um, so you say basically, I want thirty percent of my traffic to go this way and seventy percent of the traffic to go that way, uh, and priority based. Uh, uh, some of these can work pretty well, I think, with my uh, connection migration and quick version one. Uh, some of them do require some multi-path capability, and priority is really interesting because you're basically moving from one. Uh, you're basically moving from one path to another uh, based on congestion being encounter encountered. But the way it works in uh, the priority based mode is that you don't you you still don't, you're you're still only using one uh, path. So that uh, you if you wanted to do both paths after you encounter a congestion, you're going to be you you need a multi path capability. Also, next slide, please. Um, I said there are some uh, additional steering modes that uh, that are in E ATSSS. Um, 
these include things uh, that are under discussion, like uh, changing the access uh, split weights dynamically. Uh, so that basically, you know, what's what's in ATSSS uh, is only is only um, using uh, you only you only ch you only change the split if you have a a path that goes down. Uh, so this is uh, being able to change uh, access splitting dynamically, uh, forwarding on both accesses when necessary to provide redundancy. Uh, this one I really kind of dig. Uh, forwarding on both accesses if the RTT difference between those two uh, paths is below a threshold, so that basically they become functionally uh, equivalent to each other. But if they're not, then you go on the uh, you go on the one with the shortest RTT, and uh, kind of a catch-all. Uh, the UA UE making decisions about uplink access on its own based on lots of things. Uh, none, none of these, I think, can be supported only using only migration that's to, as defined in Quick Version One. So uh, my point of showing that slide is basically to say that. Uh, is basically to say that uh, where we seem to be headed is a lot more dynamic uh, use of use of multiple paths. Um, next slide, please. So, like I said, what we're trying to do is uh, support traffic splitting across multiple accesses for any IP or Ethernet traffic within order delivery. Uh, we really hope we can do that with multipath quick uh, because it's building on the synergies of the quick stack. We know that the UEs are going to uh, already have a quick stack. So if we don't do something with quick, we're going to be doing it some other way. Um, and uh, like I said, what we're really what we're really shooting for is simultaneous use of multiple paths with in order delivery within a stream split over multiple paths. I think that's my last slide. Uh, questions? Rapidly moving, we will go to Martin Duke first. Hi, Martin. Hi, Spencer. Um, thanks for this. I, I, I Maybe I'm not following, but I think what you're showing us is customer quick packets encapsulated inside datagram frames of, of uh, an outer quick connection. Is that accurate? I think I think that's going to be true. I, sh I should mention the people that are looking at this right now are at the are at the architecture level, and okay. uh, that's that's going to be stage two level, and that's going to be something that the stage three guys are actually going to be discussing in more detail. So so I, I wonder why. So if, if that is in fact the use case, like why not just use like a layer three solution and just switch quick packets over multiple paths rather than have another layer transport. Um, I so if you if you back up to maybe what the third slide, um, yeah. So basically, the the picture that's the picture that's here is what's deployed now, uh, which is which is uh, like I say, one of the things is multipath TCP, and the other is a uh, low layer uh, ATSS LL low layer um, solution now, or something like that. So I think they're trying to. Um, basically, reason from what they're what they're working with now to where they should be going. Uh, I think it's fair for me to say that uh, this work is probably more uh, probably early in the process that you're going to get from most SDOs coming into the ITF. But uh, 3GPP really wanted to work closely with um, the ITF so that they weren't. Uh, trying to du duplicate things that the ITF was going to be doing, so you know that's 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 what you're what you what you just asked is a very interesting question. Thank you. Can I, yeah, can I just jump in for a second here, maybe to clarify yes. this a little bit more? Um, so what you described is actually ATSSS lower layer. So there's no additional um, protocol, um, and this ATSSS lower layer mode is only supporting. Um, uh, steering and switching. Uh, what they don't want to do is really use both of the paths simultaneously because that would introduce a lot of reordering and that have can have negative effects, um, especially as you don't know, like you want to realize this for all kind of a um, IP and Ethernet traffic, so you don't know what the traffic above is. So they try to avoid reordering. That's like the main point here. Thank you, Mary. Okay. 
we we're very short of time so i'm gonna move on to richard to ask the next question but please keep questions and answers Hi, richard. oh hello good evening yeah richard bradbury bbc here um i just want to do you have to know what the um anticipated time scale for this at sss work is is it is it a release 17 3 gpp item do they, do they want to get it done and dusted in the next 18 months that that is that is that is the current plan of record in 3gpp okay and do you think itf can rise to that challenge uh i'm here <laughs> <laughs> okay sorry i should have said my name Amir uh, let me jump in again so um yeah so this is under discussion currently there are different solutions proposed for release um 17. uh due to the whole crisis there's also discussion about extending the deadlines for release 17 by six months. Um, and so I think what they need is really they need some kind of um, stable or adopted working group draft. They don't need to have all the de details figured out because there are no dependencies on the actual details of how this is realized, as long as they know that there will be some MP quick support at some point. Okay, so they're happy to, they're happy to um, not have RFCs, for example. That's yeah. We have there's there are many uh, specifications in 3GPP where there's not an RFC yet. There is like uh, a lot of discussion in 3GPP right now how mature this is, and it's definitely not mature enough as we don't know that the quick working group will work on it. But as soon as there's a working group document, there could be like a level where they could just move on. Okay, cool. Thanks. I I, I think it's uh, if I could just uh, how much how long has it been? We gotta get to the questions, sure, guys. We, sure, we are sure. already quite late. Sorry. Sure, that's fine. Okay, let's move on to David, please. Hi, David. Thank you. Uh, it's me again, David Skenazi, Google. Um, so Spencer, sp thanks all for the presentation, especially the terminology that helped a lot because it's very different from what I'm personally used to. So you, that was great. Um, you described benefits of this project um, in terms of like network, like I can use both paths and I think that's cool. Um, Sorry, great, I have a police car outside. Um, but the uh, what, what I'm kind of having a hard time understanding is what is the benefit to the user in your mind? Um, so I, th I think the, 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 the benefit, so this, this, is, this, is the, this is the provider view of what we're talking about. And I think the use case, many of the other use case presentations have been about the use cases that the providers are expecting to have running over their networks. Does, does, does that, does that make sense? So, you know, if, uh, if they're going to be if they're going to be doing if they're going to be doing music over the net, you know over the network it would this that's kind of what the three GPP guys are expecting is going to happen on their networks. Does does that help? So, uh, well, let me. I'm not sure I understood. Let me rephrase what you just said to make sure I understood. It sounds like you're David, saying there's no user benefit, one, but this is good for the provider. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I no, I'm sorry. I'm I'm saying I think that I'm uh, like this is the, what I'm talking about is the provider view, which uh, which may assume which I think in the other use case uh, presentations even did assume that there were benefits for both the users and the and the providers. So I understand that we're assuming that there are benefits, but what are those benefits? If we're going to take on work in the IETF, I think it would be good to think about what, why we're doing it, right? Yes, uh, I think mostly what I'm saying. I, I think mostly what I'm saying is that th those discussions happened in three GPP a long time ago. <laughs> Okay, and and we don't we don't know the uh, outcome of those conversations. Uh, they happened before Spencer got there. Okay, no, no worries. If you don't know the answer, that's fine. Sorry, I didn't <laughs> let, mean to let, put you on the spot. Yeah, yeah, let me let me jump in for a second again. So um, I think in the setup you have here, um, the benefit you get is that you actually have a direct interface between the UE and the and the um, network, as well as um, the the proxy endpoint, which is directly in the network, has knowledge about what's going in the network. So you can actually provide some guidance to the UE to 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 give more information about which path to use. Um, but, uh, Maria, if I may, I'm not talking about anything in the network. I'm talking about as a user who is using a cell phone, well, a smartphone, yes. what benefit do I get? 
Yes. So you're, you're using a smartphone. You have two passes available. Uh, if, if the server provides multi-pass support, you could as well do this end to end, right? Um, but then you don't get any information from the network about what the network conditions are currently and which pass is the better one to use for, for you right now in your current situation. And that's a benefit you get here. Okay. I I'm sorry. Maybe I'm doing a very poor job of explaining myself. Uh, as an end user, I'm not talking about me as someone who works in networking standards. I'm talking about an end user who wants to visit a web page, watch a video, live stream, whatever. What is the benefit to the end user, like to someone that is non technical? So I think you're asking you're asking a, um, a question about how tackers, for example, um, put in the tariffs. And there is, for example, the idea that if you have ATSSS and the network can tell you to offload your your traffic to a managed network to a Wi-Fi network as soon as you can, then you get like unlimited data or whatever. That might be um, a subscription that you want to choose, and that requires this kind of function support in the network. But that's really not the technical question here. David. So, so, so yeah, the answer I'm getting is that this is useful for network operators and they're interested in this. And, and that's a reasonable reason to do things. Don't get me wrong. But we're saying that there's no benefit to the user. Okay. Thank you. So, so sorry, may, may Hanno, Hanno Flink stepping. So the benefits Guys, are, we got to move, we, we got to move on. Okay. This is, this is a general discussion. We've, we're already eaten half of our general discussion time and um, okay. Mike wins the prize for, for the uh, last agenda bash, which happened, and he promised he can do this. So there's one more use case that wasn't on the agenda when we started, which is here now. So he has one slide in one minute, and there's not going to be any questions, Mike, so you better uh, nail this one. Okay, I'll do my best. So the very short version is that we have been talking about a scenario where clients make requests. We have lots of different instances that may or may not be the same location. The instance that gets the client's connection might not have all the resources that the, um, that the client's requesting. And so right now that instance has to go fetch those resources from other nodes that do have a copy. And it would be nice if it were possible for those other nodes to send the content directly back to the client, which basically means a distributed server instance. The that's something that we can do with quick right now. Potentially, you would have to have some coordination between the instances, give it a range of packet numbers that it can use, but it produces a lot of apparent reordering because they aren't able to coordinate sending packet numbers in the right sequence. If you have separate packet number spaces and multipath, you could probably make this look a lot cleaner, but it would be nice if certain things about the path can happen on each path and the client would still see it as a distributed server with multiple ip addresses and i'm slightly over my minute so there you go so mike one uh disclosure uh, as a third party here is that i believe that nokia holds ipr on this idea f at least for multipath tcp and i know this because it's my patent okay thank you for letting us know Right, so we didn't give you questions. So let's get to the general discussion. And again, the, the point of this uh, session was to understand what some of these different use cases. You're on mute, Lars. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> sorry, it's been a long day. Um, so the, the purpose of the meeting was to figure out what uh, the these use cases are in a bit more detail and what requirements they would have for um, functionality that's maybe missing in quick version one and and i think this was uh helpful there was a lot to chew on and it was a little bit all over the place but i, I would specifically maybe use this remaining 20 minutes to see um what use cases if any i think we've seen this in the beginning could maybe already be supported with what uh, version one offers uh, specifically um, migration and migration to preferred address and then uh, a second part of the discussion would be whether there are um, other pieces of functionality that we might want to consider adding to version one in some form that would maybe support uh, many, hopefully, of these other use cases. And I'm guessing there's a queue building that Lucas is going to run again. And, and pl please keep it short. Um, we only have 20 minutes left. 
Martin Duke, step up. Yes, yeah, speaking as an individual, Martin Duke, F5. Um, to the, so I, I think migration is very, very close to solving many of these use cases. But one thing that I'm seeing is that there's a lot of hot switching back and forth between the ideal path. And the current migration assumption is that once you migrate off a path, you can more or less throw it away. So that um, that drives us. So, so I think like there's only a small amount of, of protocol you need to resolve that. I think Christian's draft actually has a lot of the pieces you need. The, the other thing I'd say is that um, we saw a lot of different use cases and those use cases implied a whole bunch of different schedulers. So this further um, solidifies a conviction that we should not tackle that problem and we should build a little protocol to the, the protocol necessary to enable experimentation in all of these areas. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Christian. Thank you. This is Christian Wittema. Yes, I mean, the, the one thing I learned today, and the, the great idea is uh, the point that Roberto made, and also that was uh, reinforced by uh, Christopher, that basically scheduling belongs in the application. I mean, if you have any kind of complex scheduling, it has to be done by the application. And it's silly to believe that you can build machinery uh, embedded deeply inside the stack that does better than the application. So I think that there is a need for probably a simple kind of a hot standby kind of scenario in which you have two lines and you send arbitrary traffic on one or the other based on a very simple algorithm. But anything more, sim more complex, I think that Roberto is right. It'd be better to have several connections that can be coordinated with a lightweight code management system so that, hey, I do that connection and then I do another connection to exactly the same server. And then the application sees those connections and does its scaling of them however it sees fit. And that seems like a much better plan than trying to build a ton of complexity inside the quick stack. Thank you. Next up, Ian. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was curious to hear a little bit more from Quickly since they do something very similar to this on the direct server return stuff. But I, I tend to think that there are two states of the world, one in which only one server is sending um, like a video playback where the video is all on one server, uh, in which case you don't need to deal with the re rearing problem in a special way and things largely just work and the existing solution is, is pretty sensible and you can just do DSR. And then the other state of the world where the app frequency draft uh, solves your problem by just um, allowing you to control acknowledgments and ignore reordering entirely. Um, and I think that's probably what Quickly is doing, but I'd like a uh, confirmation of that, uh, which is another way of saying, I think we we might have drafts that already exist that completely solve the direct server return sort of problem that was just presented, um, which is not to say we have solved all the other problems, but yeah. Thank you. Next up, Martin Tom. I was just typing out my response. Um, so um, I think this is an interesting discussion. There's a bunch of things here that are interesting. Christian pointed something out that I think I was about to say as well, is that there's interesting interactions between the application and the, and the thing. And, and Quick Paps is a little bit less susceptible to the sorts of uh, opacity problems that result from embedding these sorts of capabilities deep in the network or deep in the OS where you don't have a whole lot of visibility on, into what's going on. But um, I want to up level a little bit. The question that I would prefer us ask is um, what should the quick working group be working on next rather than uh, should we be doing multipath? Because I, I think that I've been convinced at least from this that there is, is some value in some cases in having multipath at some point in the future. The problem though is that I don't think that uh, we'll get the sort of synergies to use um, uh, uh, the, the point that Spencer brought up, uh, the synergies with the deployed protocol if we uh, allow the protocol to fork. And I don't see that the people who are deploying quick actively right now being interested in, in doing some multipath stuff.
Thank you, Martin. Uh, next, Eric. I, I think we've seen a couple of things just now. One of them is we knew going in that migration doesn't cover bandwidth aggregation. That was very deliberate. And it was kind of intentionally set up such that that was minimally prohibited with the idea that somebody could write a very minimal extension that would kind of re-enable that and turn those on for folks who wanted to experiment with it without signing everybody else up who's doing quick to, to support all of those mechanisms. Um, because I think one of the problems that we've seen is trying to deploy multipath is that the policy around money is kind of more problematic than many of the technology questions around scheduling and everything else. And we have seen a number of cases here that are a little different than the usual way people think about that. Specifically, if you're already on an expensive interface and have a cheaper interface that's maybe not good enough to support all of your traffic, being able to offload some of it actually saves you money, whereas most of the other multipath cases generally end up costing you money and therefore end up being heavily restricted to the point that they may not help. Um, so so that, that, is, that was new for me, so I just wanted to say thank you to the folks who are presenting that. Um, the last thing here, specifically to what MT was just saying, is I think Roberto's point about applications needing to be able to express their scheduling needs is really, really good. And so either applications need to be able to tell the system, hey, here are my scheduling needs, and the system can deal with the policy, or the system needs to be able to hand the application, this is what the policy is, you know your scheduling needs, please do the right thing. But it seems like a lot of those questions aren't, let's get the quick working group to do a bunch of protocol design to make stuff work. A lot of those questions are, how do we deal with policy and platform design, not how do we build a protocol that we can actually deploy? Thank you. Next up, the MAP RG research group. Yeah, hi, this is Mia Kulivin. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to just react to Robertus because he like he was just like, you know, stating this out and then <laughs> it's gone by the by the time we didn't have a chance to comment. And I really disagree with his point of view. I don't think it's it's an accident to have it in the transport layer. Having multipass control in the transport layer enables a lot of optimizations that you can't do in the application. You can retransmit your packets that got lost on one path on the other path and so on. So that's where the benefit comes from. I agree that like for scheduling, you need some kind of input from the application. But what we've seen so far, I mean, there's a lot of room for research and finding new fancy schedulers. But what we've seen so far is that you usually have a handful of schedulers which are optimized for specific scenarios. And the, the application can just choose between those schedulers. It's a very simple interface that we need, but that's it. So I don't think that's that's the the challenge here. Um, but the benefits from integrating this into the transport layer um, are much higher. And I think this is a general feature that um, especially smaller applications that don't put like all the effort in, in developing their own stack and so on can benefit from in future if it's just there as a general feature. Thank you. Next up, Yun Fei. I, I want to uh, share more of our uh, experience with um, with the multi I uh, we definitely agree that we should keep things uh, simple. Right. So, um, and, 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 and on the other side, I think, uh, based on our experience, the current quick, uh, if user truly want to, or a customer truly want to use multipass, it's, uh, still need some, uh, additional capability. So I, I, I would like to, um, uh, I, I, I think the, the, be the, the, the best way is to review all the proposal and to see if there is uh, a simple way for us to enable this capability. And I, I definitely agree that also a lot, a lot of the policy, and a lot of the, especially for the scheduler, it needs to be decided by the schedule. And, and also uh, one comment on, uh, on, the, on the money side. So we do see, uh, so one issue, right? So uh, coming from uh, multipass quick is that for some customer, the uh, traffic charges for cellular and Wi-Fi, they're, they're different. And so I, I, think, I think one way is, uh, at least for us, is to collaborate with some uh, mobile carriers and so that we know that when the customer are using our app and they can get free charge for both wi-fi and lte and so we so that, that that's that's how we tackle this problem thank you uh next up jana um just to remind people we have nine minutes left of this session i would guess lars wants some time to wrap up at the end so please please keep it oh good so i got eight minutes um, 
Jan Iyengar. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, just a few quick points. One uh, on the on the policy and scheduling thing. I, I think Eric said it really well. There's a uh, uh, the use of a multiple paths is fundamentally something that is tied very closely to the network and to the application. There's just no two ways about it. You either make the API really thin between the application and the transport, or you make the application decide. That's a question of where you draw the line of the API and what really you expose through the API. But fundamentally, uh, multipath is tied deeply to its use case. This is something that I, 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 I really was hoping that people would bring out more during the presentations, but I, I feel like it didn't come through very much. I think uh, I, I love uh, um, some presentations which did make it more explicit, but the application is super critical in terms of uh, uh, figuring out exactly what multipath even means. Another way of reading, another way of saying this is that a charter, as we have it right now in Quick, we've effectively done multipath. Connection migration is multipath. For people who don't believe that, I'm happy to have a conversation separately. Use of multiple paths is what multipath is. And so uh, arguably connection migration is already doing that. So the question for me still uh, in, in a number of cases remains, what experience do we have with connection migration? How can we tweak it to make things work better? This brings me back to this point of uh, uh, priorities and, and our lack of experience and, and what Martin said right up at the beginning. Uh, up leveling this whole conversation again. I know that multipath is useful in a number of cases, and it uh, it's it's super interesting to work on. We know this. This is something that that uh, uh, has value. The question, however, is given that we have a piece of multipath in Quick, how much does that give us, and how much do we need to add to it, and how do we in increase it? I have actually use cases that right now I I haven't. Uh, uh, really figure out if the signaling in multipath is going to be enough for me. Uh, and that's something I'd like to see happen, but I'm waiting to get multipath, uh, waiting to get quick deployed with connection migration so that I can figure out exactly what more pieces I need. Um, so I would say that we, we really should have the discussion around priorities of what we want to get done. I really want to see version negotiation happen. That's the first thing I want to see happen next. As a working group, we can keep bringing on more things, but we need to prioritize. And uh, my uh, other uh, point is about just lack of experience. We, I would love for us to have more experience with connection migration before we decide what more we want to do, how, how we want to extend the signaling further, how we want to extend our multipath capabilities, which we already have further. Thank you. Uh, David, please. I'll keep it short. Um, so what I'm getting from this meeting is we have two main use cases for multipath. One is multipath to a proxy, so ATSSS, kind of, and one is multipath end-to-end. -end. So I just want to make a point about each. Uh, the first one, um, so from the discussion earlier, it sounds like there's no clear benefit to end users. And I'm going to quote RC8890, which came out earlier this year. The internet is for end users. So that's really what we should focus on. Uh, so I really don't think that Quick is a good fit for ATSSS. Uh, if the 3GPV wants to work on this, that's good. But if they're asking us to remove encryption and to add complexity, I'm not sure why they're using Quick in the first place. So I would suggest perhaps using something uh, different, maybe you know GRE or some other encapsulation between IP and IP. Uh, and I'm seeing plus ones in the chat. Thank you, folks. Uh, now on the second point, end-to-end -end multipath. This one, I think, might have value to the end user. Um, the question is, I'm not going to repeat it. I'm just going to agree strongly with Jana. Um, we need to prove that this is better than connection migration. All of the data I've seen so far doesn't take into account connection migration. And then uh, in, until we do that, I'd say we need to prioritize other work in the quick working group, such as the extensions that we have already adopted and probably other things. That's it, thank you. Thanks, we, we may well get cut off in the next few minutes. So I'd like to get through as many people as possible. Uh, we'll go with Kazuo next, but yeah, let's try and keep it. Uh, so I'll uh, I just wanted to make a small comment regarding schedule policies. 
Well, I agree with Mary that the transport can provide a generic mechanism for uh, from which the application can use uh, so some kind of policy or design policy. I would point out that that approach has failed with HTTP2 because the schema is too complicated and only a fraction of the servers implemented things correctly. So I think it would be safer if we move in small steps based on use cases rather than trying to design something generic. That's all. Thank you. Spend Sorry. Um, so I, I would just real quickly wanted to say um, experimental was good enough for what I was hoping for from a multipath quick. Uh, is experimental not good enough for any? Is there anyone for whom experimental is not good enough? Okay, moving on. Uh, Olivier? Yes, so I just want to answer Martin and uh, Roberto about where to put multipass. Is it in layer three or is it above in the application layer? I think multipass belongs to layer four because this is where we have uh, congestion control information and this is where we have retransmission capabilities and both work together. Thank you. Yun Fei? Uh, so I want to uh, give one comment on the connection migration. So so one, one thing, uh, so we figure out that the connection, if you compare connection migration with uh, LTE, right? So can you, can, can connection migration in quick do better than LTE handover, right? Because LTE between the base station, there is X2 interface for exchanging the context. And so, so given that for some extreme mobility use cases, I think, uh, with multi uh be better than even the LTE handover. So that's uh, one of the comments I want to make to everyone. Okay, thank you. And that is the end of the queue from when I cut it. Uh, Lars, have you got any closing statement you'd like to make? Well, um, nothing than uh, thanking Robin, first of all, who's been taking our minutes. That was a heroic effort. Um, it seems clear um, that we need uh, Eric. More. But Eric, thank you both. Um, it seems clear that we need to talk more. Um, I, I encourage you to uh, use the mailing list for this rather than, than GitHub issues or something like that. Uh, it's, it's a better vessel. Um, we will monitor the discussion. We'll, we'll um, probably have a follow-up discussion on the list. Uh, it's always possible to have another one of these, uh, maybe with more time for um, discussion than we had. I also encourage people that sort of presented use cases and saw similarities between them to maybe, you know, talk amongst yourselves and figure out whether you can consolidate your use cases or come up with some, you know, joint proposals for what could be taken forward. Um, but I think this, the, 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 this is a hard problem, right? Because um, the, the, it's unclear how much te uh, technology, how much technology, it's too late for me to do this. Um, it's it's unclear what functionality is missing at the moment. It's it's unclear whether the stacks that are at the moment getting very large deployments are even interested in deploying this. It's it's uh, some some scheduling questions are unclear. You know um, what information the application needs to uh, have, what um, information the quick stack needs to have, and so on. So this is a hard problem. And we did multipath TCP, right? It was like a three-year um, EU-funded research project, and then a whole bunch of standardization at the end of it. And then a whole bunch of implementation work. Um, we can leverage that to some degree, but but Quick also brings new new challenges, and so um, we need to carefully think what we want to do. I, I hope we can find something that is small and that will enable um, experimentation, and that that might already support some of the use cases directly that we can start with, and then continue to to like move forward if if this gets traction. I I am hesitant to sort of see us doing you know, a full multipath architecture in like one go, that would be a pretty heavy lift, I think. Um, with that, it's one minute past and WebEx hasn't cut us off, so I must have configured it correctly to not do that, uh, which still means we're done. Um, use the mailing list, um, you know, uh, talk to each other, talk to Lucas and me, see if um, we need more discussion time like this. Um, and we'll see if we uh, have some agenda time in, uh, well, I was gonna say in Bangkok, but I guess at ITF 109. Thank you all. Good evening, good day, good night, good morning.
Thank you all.